Civil Rights, Part 2. In this particular section of the course, we are going to look at the nature of civil rights. We want to examine how those civil rights evolved over time. Really, we are going to look at the period right after the end of the Civil War, 1865 to 1870, and a little bit beyond until today. This will then set us up to better understand the origins of the civil rights movement. Uh, we are going to look at racial categories and examine the extent to which they are socially constructed. And we are going to analyze the Emmett Till case. The documentary is called The Murder of Emmett Till, and you are assigned to view it today. Let me start out by defining civil rights. Civil rights are about equal treatment, or to be free from unfair treatment or discrimination. Typically, the concept is applied to a number of settings, including education, employment, housing, and a couple of more. Also, please note that the terms civil rights and civil, civil liberties are often used interchangeably, However, they are not synonymous. Civil rights are different from civil liberties. The concept of civil rights revolves around the basic right to be free from unequal treatment. Civil liberties, on the other hand, are more broad-based rights and freedoms that are guaranteed at the federal level by the Constitution. The most probably important civil liberties are enshrined in the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, freedom of speech, religion, press, and assembly. When we talk about discrimination, inequality, we typically talk about civil rights, and we are asking the question, what should government do to establish equality? <coughs> Let me start out with a very brief, very brief historical background. So we are starting out in the era right after the Civil War with the passage of the post-Civil War amendments. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery and slavery. The 14th Amendment addresses citizenship rights and equal protection of the laws. The 15th Amendment gave former slaves the right to vote. Immediately after the Civil War, the situation for the former slaves really dramatically improves. More than 4 million slaves gained their freedom. But of course, rebuilding the South during this period of Reconstruction introduced a couple of very significant challenges. But the newly enfranchised blacks gained a voice in government for the first time. They are winning election in southern state legislatures and even to the United States Congress. They are opening businesses and economically speaking, there are some significant improvements. Congress in fact, during this period, right after the Civil War, passed a series of Civil Rights Act consolidating the path toward equality. I think what is probably the most remarkable about this era of Reconstruction is that it was so extremely short-lived. In less than a decade after the Civil War, Reactionary forces, including the KKK, really were successful in reversing the changes wrought by Reconstruction. What we see is a violent backlash that restored white supremacy in the South and also established a system of segregation in the North. The period of Reconstruction comes to an end in 1877 and many civil rights measures, such as allowing blacks to serve on juries, 
were then immediately overturned. In addition, many local laws and regulations called black codes were really established for blacks to be kept in their place. These laws made offenses such as loitering, unemployment, indebtedness, voting, and even having sex with white women illegal for blacks. Blacks who disobeyed these laws were fined, arrested, or worse. Supreme Court case that really best illustrates this revival of white supremacy and writing white supremacy into the Constitution is Plessy v. Ferguson from 1896, a major setback for early civil rights activists. At issue in Plessy uh, were Louisiana segregation laws. Can railroad cars be segregated into white only and black only train and I should say non white train compartments. Homer Blessy, born a free man, a person who is seven eight, seven eighths Caucasian and one eighth African American, sits in a white only train compartment. However, under Louisiana law, he was classified as black because a person with only one drop of African-American blood, remember he's one-eighth African-American, is classified as black, thus he's required to sit in the colored car. The decision declared that segregated public and private facilities for blacks and whites were separate but equal. Look at the quote here from the decision. Justice Brown saying that the court does not believe that the enforced separation of the two races stamps the colored race with a badge of inferiority. If this be so, it is not by reason of anything found in the act, but only because the colored race chooses to put that construction upon it. So the court is saying segregation has nothing to do with equality. Let's go back to the example of Homer Blessing and the one drop rule. What is the meaning of race? What is the point of categorizing people as black or white? And how have these categorizations served to uphold the status quo? Homer Blessy, one drop of Negro blood, one eighth African American was considered black. Many southern states actually adopted one drop rule laws in the beginning of the 20th century. Any person of mixed race was classified as African American, and mixed race people who identified as American Indian were actually often reclassified as black in order to prevent blacks of trying to pass as Indians. What is also interesting is that the United States is really unique in developing the one drop rule, which derived from the southern slave culture and the aftermath of the Civil War. People in many other countries, Brazil would be a good example, have tended to treat race less rigidly, both in their self-identification and how they regard others. So for instance, in Brazil, someone with partial Caucasian ancestry 
may be considered white in Brazil, even if he or she is mixed race. Typically, people who would pass as white in Brazil are people from an, more of an upper social class background. In the United States, however, it had nothing to do with social status or education. It was really just based on race. Is this still relevant today? Maybe. Consider how most people think about President Obama. We think about him as the first African-American president, not the first mixed race president or not a white president. He's as much white as he's black, but obviously he self-identifies as black and in addition, is viewed by most of society as African-American. My broader point here is that race is socially constructed. And science, remember, or see here that I put science in quotation mark because it really was more of a pseudoscience, was often used to support or justify the belief in racism, racial inferiority, or white racial superiority. Pseudoscientific research was used to justify slavery, coming up with arguments that black men are uniquely fitted for bondage because of their primitive psychological organizations, uh, arguments that Black men in bondage are actually healthier than northern free blacks who would be more likely to suffer mental illnesses at higher rates than did their southern counterparts. Or the claim that mixed race offspring, offspring tended to be physically weaker and infertile. So these studies were trying, trying very hard to make the point that race is a meaningful biological construct, that there are real genetic differences between individuals from different racial backgrounds. Today's research would conclude that there are very, 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 very few biological genetic differences. So race is not so much a biological phenomena, but a social myth which has created an enormous amount of human and social damage. Also, let me also include this thought here. What about classifications based on gender? There are only very, very small biological differences based on race, certainly less than differences, biological, genetic differences between men and women, between the genetic material of males versus females. But similar to the pseudoscientific research constructing racial differences, gender differences have often been used to solidify the different social status and roles of men and women. And these pseudoscientists then would point toward differences in the size of the male and the female brain. Typically, the male brain is slightly larger, slightly heavier than the female brain, for the simple reason that brain size and weight correlates with body size and weight. But those differences have been constructed to make the argument that men are more intelligent, thus barring women from institutions of higher learning. Once you have the assumption that men are more intelligent because their brain is larger or heavier, it is easy to say that men should attend institutions of higher learning, not women. In addition, scientists made the argument that too much rigorous education would make women infertile because the blood that is supposed to be in the womb 
would then be reoriented toward the brain and women would become either infertile or would not be able to have healthy offsprings. That also came up in a decision we actually already analyzed earlier. Recall in 1873, the Supreme Court accepted the argument that granting a woman the right to practice law is justified because the strive of the bar would surely destroy femininity. <clears throat> Let's go back to the historical context. We talked about the civil rights, the post-civil rights amendments. We talked about the period of reconstruction. Civil rights organizations form in response to the white supremacy movement and culture. Among them, the most prominent among them, founded in 1909, the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, an organization which devoted much of its energy between World War I and World War II to fighting the lynching of blacks and fighting against segregation, mostly in education. Most of our emphasis will be placed on the modern day, the more contemporary 60s, 70s civil rights movement. And if we look at it historically, you might ask, so when did it start? This is a question rather difficult to answer because there is not a single year the post-World War II civil rights movement started. But often, movements are defined by certain events, by certain events that have the power to mobilize people. Because for a social movement to succeed, you need individuals to stop thinking about their role in the world, politics, social areas, as just individuals. They need to understand that their fate is tied to their social group. So we need the development of a group identity. An event that was crucial in mobilizing supporters of the civil rights movement, black and white, an event that really served as this important mobilizing event was the murder of Emmett Till. This is why I've assigned you to watch the documentary Emmett Till's murder made national news, made international news, and really convinced many people who were sitting on the sidelines before to join the movement. So it really was the spark that was needed to start organizing, or better organizing, the movement. Please do watch the documentary, The Murder of Emmett Till, it is a really, really interesting glance at a couple of things. First of all, it shows us how, how profound segregation was in Mississippi in 1955. It shows us the segregated justice system. And it is also important in order to understand how the civil rights movement came about.